Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Egg Whisper. I'm so excited to be here. And it's Tuesday, Blues Day. And you can see my blue roses in the back there. One of my best friends gave them to me. They delivered yesterday. And they're so pretty. So thank you, Catherine. So the first question is from Corey. And here we go, guys. Corey says, hello. Thank you so much for doing this podcast. It's been so good to listen to on our fertility journey. My partner's most recent semen analysis done was not great at all. As a quick background, January 2020, 25 million, fairly low motility. July 2020, 8 million, lower motility rate. August and October analysis, they couldn't find anything. He took pregnant shots for three months before our last test, also taking a few supplements daily. Do you have any recommendations on supplements that might increase our chances or testing that we should be doing to see why this was such a huge drop? Oh, Corey, I am so sorry. That's really scary to go from 25 to 8 million to no sperm. We have to see what's going on. I'm, it sounds like you're talking to a urologist, but doing a testicular exam, I think, will be really important. Look for a var varicocele and look for any other anatomic reason why this could be happening. Could this be genetic? Mm, my gut is probably not. It could be something called, like, like we have as women, um, not like we have. I mean, guys don't run out of sperm for the most part like we do as women, but there is a condition called testicular failure. And since he's been on the pregnant shots, you're not going to be able to test his FSH to get a reliable um, read on it the same way we can test our FSH. So if he wasn't on the pregnant shots or the HCG shots to increase his sperm count, what we would want him to do is an FSH estradiol, even an LH level as well. Look for a thyroid issue um, and then you know talk to a urologist that really knows their stuff because sometimes they can do things inside the testicle to map out sperm to see exactly where those where those guys are hiding and uh, and then see um, what you learn from there. So my heart goes out to you because that's kind of a it's kind of an overwhelming situation to be in where you had it and then you didn't and you want answers. So you're definitely asking the right questions. This next question is from Kara. I have a birth control pill question. Which birth control would you recommend to better preserve fertility? I personally have a very low egg count in my early 20s and I also went through chemo, but would like to get on birth control for a few years until the chemo is out of my body, but I also hate putting extra hormones in my body. Kara, I'm so glad you asked this question, so let me just break it down for you. Birth control pills are not fertility preservation pills. FPP stands for fertility planning pills. I mean, they kind of help you plan an IVF cycle or frozen embryo transfer cycle, but they're not fertility preserving. However, if a woman has, let's say a condition that could be fertility threatening, like endometriosis or fibroids, birth control pills can absolutely slow down the progression of endometriosis and potentially even help with fibroids in some cases. So for you, I would suggest take CoQ10, talk to a fertility specialist, get whatever eggs you have frozen, frozen for you as soon as possible. Get your AMH checked. It sounds like you know what it is. And that's kind of what I would suggest for you if you were a patient of mine. And just know that chemo is out of your body. The half-life of chemotherapy is really, really short. So you don't have to worry that it's still in your body. You can go right to a fertility specialist right now and talk to them about freezing your precious eggs. This next question is from Kelly. Kelly said, hi, Dr. Amy. I'm currently diagnosed with lean PCOS. I have an AMH of 26, a day three estradiol of 28, and an FSH of 5. You guys, there are people out there that have an FSH of 26. I have seen them myself as well. I've done four rounds total of Femera and Clomid and have been completely unresponsive. I'm currently taking a month of birth control and starting metformin and was advised to gain weight, which I did. What would your recommendations be for my next round? I was going to start a hybrid cycle with the Merimenopur, but I'm unable to get it. So Kelly, I totally see what, what you mean, like you're unable to get it. For you guys who don't know that, some pharmacies aren't dispensing Menopure, um, but a lot of pharmacies are. So if you're having a hard time now, today, getting Menopure, um, let me know. I can tell you where to get it from. Um, as far as what I would do in a case like yours, I'm going to break it down to you. Um, number one, dexamethasone. One milligram or half tablet a day every single morning until you ovulate. Number two, uh, naltrexone part of my special sauce for people who have PCOS who aren't responsive to Clomid, Femera, either one of them. So taking 50 milligrams, half a tablet per day until your ovulation day works like a charm. That in addition to the Femera. 
And then there are lots of different ways of doing, dosing Femera. So you can do Femera even for 10 days. You can even take Femera with Clomid. You can even go up to Femera five tablets per night, not just four tablets per night. So I would definitely do the four tablets per night for five nights with the Dex and Naltrexone. And then if you aren't responding, just restart the Femera right away, another five nights, and then go back and see what you're gonna see. With an AMH of 26 with boatloads of eggs, I would still try and stay away from Menopure shots. And if there's a shortage, that's no big deal. Like you can use Gonal F, you can use Folistem. I really don't think that you necessarily need Menopure, or I should say Menopure, the French version of the fertility drugs. It's not French. I just like saying Menopure because it sounds very je ne sais quoi. Okay. So this next question is from Nicole. Nicole said, hi, Dr. Amy, I'm scheduled for an FET on my birthday in a couple weeks. Well, there's no better present. And I feel always lucky on people's birthdays. And I hope that you're going to have good luck on your birthday too. I had a normal HSG within the last year and my uterus looked great. We were going to move forward with the FET without doing a hysteroscopy, but my doctor said we could do a saline sano in the same cycle as the FET if I wanted. Do you recommend saline sano in the same cycle or is it safer to proceed without it. And I know every doctor, Nicole, has different opinions about this. But for me, I would say I have no problem doing a saline sonogram in someone in the same cycle as their FET. Sometimes people don't have polyps and then they have polyps. And sometimes they grow polyps like right in the beginning of their FET cycle. So sometimes I have patients start their medications as soon as the blood flow is done after their period is over. I have them come in for a saline sonogram and then they still come back in one more time for their lining check appointment. So just with a little tiny bit of saline, I don't feel like that's going to interrupt or get in the way of my transfer success rate. So I bet your doctor feels the same if they're recommending that for you. But I have been tricked before. I have been. And it just makes me mad. And what I mean by that is I've been tricked. Like I've done the saline sono, there was no polyp. And then I did a hysteroscopy and there's a polyp. And you're like, what the heck? Like I spent all this money on this gorgeous ultrasound machine that's supposed to be top of the line. I'm supposed to see like the tiniest things. And then sometimes I don't see them. So that does happen. The other day I had a saline sauna. It was totally negative, And I just wanted to be a thousand percent sure. I'm like, oh, I'm probably just wasting my time with a hysteroscopy. And sure enough, there was a stinking polyp. It was tiny though, super tiny. So who knows if it really would be clinically significant. It just made me feel like, wow, okay, there's clearly a reason why in my gut I still wanted to do a hysteroscopy and I just couldn't put my finger on it. So this next question is from Paula. Paula says, hi, Dr. Amy. I had written to you a few months ago with my question about moving on to IVF if my third IUI failed. I am so happy that I did. You gave me the strength to move on. Well, thank you, Paula. I'm so glad I gave you that strength. I told you I had low AMH. I had always been heavy, 37 years old. Do you remember me? <laughs> yes, Paula, I remember you. Um, in my egg retrieval, I only had three eggs. All were mature and fertilized. Since I only had three embryos, my doctor recommended doing a fresh transfer of two embryos at day three. I ended up with a positive beta, but it was low. I ended up having a chemical pregnancy. I have one embryo left, a fair eight cell quality. Fair grade eight cell. Should I look at getting... Um, so the question is, what are my chances of this embryo being normal? I wasn't prepared for a day three transfer doing not able being due to not being able to test the embryo, but went along with it anyways. So Paula, this is what I would do. I don't know how many babies you have at home, but do another cycle first. Your eight cell fair graded embryo just tells me to try again before too long. Do embryo creation first, and then you can maybe do a little tr transfer, meaning you can thaw that embryo three days after your egg retrieval and put that one in and still have more embryos waiting for you in the future. And maybe this time grow your embryos out to day five, but see what your doctor says. It is not fair for me to be like, this is what you should do because every lab is different. Every doctor feels differently about the strengths of their lab and they know your personal information way better than some lady on Instagram talking about this stuff does. So those are the questions that I would ask. And it seems like the fact that you got three eggs three mature, three fertilized, three embryos just tells me that this is a great time to do it again so that you can get the same kind of results, but hopefully this time a really, really strong beta HCG. This next question is from Lee. Lee says, hi, I'm 38 years old. Can I get pregnant with luteinized unruptured follicle syndrome, aka trapped egg syndrome? I had a 10,000 HCG trigger shot three different cycles and it didn't work. So the answer is, Lee, your doctor would know more about that than 
me here because the details of exactly what happened to your, during your egg retrieval, I don't know. Have I seen that happen before? I actually have. I saw one patient with it uh, maybe like 14 years ago and it knocked my socks off and I'd never seen it before and I've never seen it uh, since, I should say. So I would talk to your doctor about um, the three different cycles and talk through things like should I try a dual trigger? Should I add FSH to my trigger shot? Should I be triggered at perhaps 37 hours instead of 36 hours? Should I grow my eggs to 22 to even 24 millimeters? I know that sounds like crazy in the follicle world, <laughs> but you know, for you guys who know exactly what I'm talking about, when you have an IVF challenge where you're just not getting mature eggs from someone or getting any eggs at all, you sometimes have to think about all of those things. So Lee, I hope you're successful in whatever you do next. This next question is from Felicia. Hello, Dr. Amy. Thank you for being here and helping us on our journey. I am 37. My husband's 36. I have a 15 year old from a previous relationship. I've done two cycles of IVF two months apart. I have one block tube from an old infection. The first IVF was with Cetratide. The second was with Lupron Microdose Flare. The first cycle, I had 12 eggs, four mature, three fertilized, all arrested on day three. The second cycle, eight eggs, two mature, and both stopped growing on day three as well, and we've exhausted our savings on IVF. The doctor said, I have very poor egg quality, as when the eggs were retrieved, he said I have a small amount of feeder cells. I was taking metformin, NAC, NAD, prenatal, CoQ10 for the second round. Should I keep taking the supplements and maybe get a laparoscopy to better my chances and hope that one day I will develop a quality egg? Felicia, yes, I think that's a fabulous idea. I mean, the thing is that you have one block tube, so it means that there's another tube, but potentially there's inflammation in that tube that's related to endometriosis, maybe not infection. I think a lot of times people blame block tubes on infection because that's what we're told. We're told it's an STD, but I swear, I really think that endometriosis could be to blame in a lot of these cases and not infection from an STD. So I suggest, yeah, consider doing a laparoscopy and looking around and looking at both fallopian tubes, but you have to be prepared for one thing. You may wake up with one less tube and you, that has to be basically acceptable to you. So if your doctor sees endometriosis, we wanna treat it. If you're okay with having a tube removed, remove it and then see if that helps your future um, IVF success. I've actually seen it help before. I wouldn't accept, expect it to help everybody. And I don't know why some people might be more sensitive to the inflammation than other people. But I think for the most part, if you're open to doing a laparoscopy, given everything that you've been through, it could potentially help your, in, uh, help your fertility and equality if they identify endometriosis. So ask your doctor that. Say, would a laparoscopy help me? Yes or no? Do you see any evidence of endometriosis? Yes or no? And I think the supplements you're on are great. If you're a patient of mine, you guys all know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say take HGH, do it during your cycle. And there's so many different ways of cooking eggs. So it sounds like you've done two different protocols already. There's so many more and you can see what your doctor thinks would be the next step for you. But I'm glad you asked me that question. This next question is from Amanda. Amanda says, hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 36, currently pregnant with my third baby. My husband wants one more after this one. So this, this will be our fourth and I'll be 38 or 39 years old. Luckily, I haven't had any issues getting pregnant, but our concern is chromosomal abnormalities as I get older. I plan on continuing to take CoQ10 throughout this pregnancy to help with egg quality. Would you recommend IVF with our last pregnancy for, so that we can do embryo testing? And she says, I'm the best. Amanda, I'm not the best, but thank you so much. I love answering questions like yours. So you are so, so smart to be thinking about your future. And I applaud anyone that wants to have four kids. It takes a little bit of cuckoo to like, you know, be that person. But guess what, Amanda? I'm right there with you. I'm one of those people that has, yep, not one, two, three, but four. So I'm, I'm all, I'm, I'm totally with you. And I'll tell you what I did. And I had, I got pregnant with my fourth at 39, delivered at 40. I know, surprise, surprise. How could I even be 40 years old with this face? And yes, I am way over 40. So my point is, as soon as I delivered baby number three, what did I do? I went and I got my AMH level checked. I had already done it between babies one and two and two and three. And yes, taking CoQ10 will really help. So I think, look at your AMH level, look at your FSH estradiol level, and then think about when you wanna try for baby number four. But if it truly is over the age of 39, if you have a lower follicle count, if your AMH is a little bit on the lower side, especially if it's under 0.6, I would suggest doing IVF for genetic testing purposes, um, just so that you can take advantage of the eggs that you do have. Do you need to? No. 
Will you be um, ever regretful if you do? Possibly if you end up with more embryos that you may need. I think um, a lot of people don't take the fact that they might have unused embryos frozen as seriously as they should. So if you're someone who may not want five, six, or seven kids, and you are someone who will absolutely need to use every embryo you create, you may not want to do IVF and you might want to try naturally. Or you might just want to freeze some as eggs and fertilize half as eggs. Do you see that? Kind of like the egg whisperer kid, that karate kid. You see what I'm doing there? Okay, this next question is from Divya. Divya says, my current RE diagnosed me with PCOS. Second opinion, RE doesn't think I have PCOS. Third opinion, RE thinks I might have underlying endometriosis or adenomyosis. Okay, Divya, come see me and I'm going to arm wrestle with both of them and then we'll see if I win. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm so confused. How do I ensure what diagnosis I have? I'm 35 and will undergo third retrieval soon. Okay, Divya, first of all, go to my website, Dreamy, just like it sounds, D-R-A-I-M-E-E.org. Go to the blog search engine, put in the word PCOS or the letters. It's not really a word. And you're going to learn so much about PCOS from doing that. Basically, it's please confirm this ovary syndrome, right? How will I know you have it? Okay, let me think. Um, are your cycles irregular, yes or no? Do you have lots and lots of eggs on your ovaries, yes or no? Um, do you have signs of high androgens, yes or no? So I call PCOS, for those of you who don't know, HOPE syndrome, okay? HOPE, that's pretty fun. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing at myself because I just noticed a connection between hope syndrome and the word hope. And I always talk to you guys about hope, which is having always or having only positive and pragmatic expectations. And I didn't realize I made hope syndrome something else. Um, high androgens, ovaries with lots of eggs, periods that are irregular, and you got to pay attention to eating and exercise. So that to me is PCOS. And it's not a one size fits all diagnosis for everyone. Everyone's PCOS looks different. So you can have PCOS, like a little something, something here and a little something, something there. So you might have a little bit of P a little bit of PCOS and you might have a little bit of endometriosis and adenomyosis. But what I do for my patients is I rank the diagnosis and I go through the list and I'd be like, this is what you have. This is what I think are the biggest issues. And, and then we talk about how we can fix each and every one of them. So you give yourself the best chance of pregnancy before whatever treatment you choose. So, um, you know, do a full metabolic panel, TSH included, vitamin D, prolactin, hemoglobin A1C, testosterone level, FSH, LH, AMH, estradiol. Um, so all of those hormones can be helpful for your doctor to guide you and then heal your PCOS, balance out whatever is unbalanced, and that can also help you. And as far as endometriosis, adenomyosis, I take that stuff very, very seriously. That stuff is really bad for our egg quality and, um, and it can decrease implantation rates. So getting ahead of endometriosis and adenomyosis before it gets severe um, is really important. So if you're 35, you're going undergoing your third egg retrieval soon. I think that that's really good that you're being as aggressive as you're being. But before you even do your transfer, the doctor who said you have endometriosis or adenomyosis Ask them how they're, going to, how they're going to treat it before you transfer. There are a lot of different ways of doing it, like Depolupron and Femera with Agestin. Um, there's more surgery uh, aside from just doing an egg retrieval. So talk to your doc about that and maybe meet with an endometriosis expert, a MIGS, M-I-G-S, a minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon as well. Thank you, Divya, for asking that question. Okay, guys, this next question is from Sandra. So Sandra says, I'm 44 and I recently had an egg retrieval was able to retrieve six eggs, three made it to genetic testing. Those are pretty good stats, but here's what happened. All three came back abnormal. Hmm. Missing chromosomes. What causes this? What can we do to prevent this, Sandra? I swear to God, if I had an answer to that and I could fix it, I would be like so, so happy. Cause then like I could help so many more people have babies with their own eggs. And the issue is just, you're normal. This is called normal aging, normal ovarian aging. And, um, you know, that's what happens as we get older. And what I tell people is this, um, it is very normal to not be able to have pregnancy with the health, uh, to have a healthy pregnancy over the age of 40. When someone does, I mean, I joke and I say like, you're super abnormal because I feel like if we make it seem normal for women over the age of 40 to have a pregnancy with their own eggs, it's really unfair to like 90% of women in their forties who are trying 
So by the time you're 44, each egg has a very low chance of being genetically normal. When you get to the embryo stage, each embryo probably has like an 8 to 10% chance of being genetically normal. So that's like a 92% chance plus of not being normal. So if you were a patient of mine, I would say, let's try four to six IVF cycles. And you're like, what? Four to, did you, huh? Did you just say four to six? And if you're still making mature eggs, if they're still fertilizing, if they're still growing in the blastocyst stage, and if the quality is good enough that you can biopsy and freeze them, then I would say, yeah, I think it makes sense to keep going. Otherwise, I would say it might be a good time to talk about other options. But talk to your doctor about, you know what, would I feel better doing a cycle that worked with donor egg than doing another IVF cycle with my own eggs that didn't work? If the answer is yes, then start exploring that. Don't put your body through more hormones. But go through my algorithm. I said an algorithm? I'm not sure if it's an algorithm. <laughs> Embryodiamonds.com. And then make sure you've asked all the questions, the eight things that I, let me just make sure I put the number eight, guys. I know what the number eight looks like. The eight things that I put in that um, embryo diamonds, the eight things about your embryos that you should know, make sure you know those things. And what I mean by that is a lot of, um, unfortunately, genetic testing companies will list embryos as abnormal when they're really mosaic. And for me, every mosaic embryo is going to be normal until proven otherwise. And what I mean by that is transparency and honesty when it comes to genetic testing reporting is number one to me and working with a company that will do that is also very important to me. So when you are looking at the report and the report says abnormal, make sure you do a post-test consult with a genetic testing company and say, was mosaicism screened for in my embryos? And if the answer is no, you can just say like, I would like it to be. So that you feel like you're making the best decisions for yourself, not based on your doctor's priorities, but based on your own priorities. Okay, this next question is from Sarah. Sarah is saying, Hi, Dr. Amy, thank you so much on everything. I wish you were my doctor. Thank you, Sarah. That's very, very sweet. I'm 29 years old and I've had three miscarriages. I have no children yet. I've done a lot of recurrent pregnancy loss testing. My test came back normal, except I'm homozygous for PI1 and MTHFR. I've done my egg retrieval in September also, and we did PGTA on everything, and we're still waiting on our results. Do you think I should take heparin, Lovenox, and prednisone before the transfer and during the pregnancy? What are the medicines and supplements you recommend for? For embryo transfer and during pregnancy for RPL patients? And would you recommend one or two embryos for transfer in my case with recurrent miscarriages? I can't wait to hear from you. Well, thank you, Sandra. I'm so, Sarah, sorry. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so happy to be able to answer your question. For someone who's had recurrent pregnancy loss, and let's say the embryos are all normal, then I would say, you know what, I'm kind of worried that this wasn't necessarily a genetic issue that a lot of people blame um, recurrent pregnancy loss on. So then I'm going to say, yes, I would. And I would, even if you didn't have MTHFR or PI-1, but especially because you have those things, I would recommend Lovenox. I usually start at 40 milligrams, subcutaneous, single administered dose, two days before the transfer, and then you can decide with your doctor how long you take it for. Um, as far as prednisone, I put everyone on, um, almost everyone, because not everyone can tolerate it, on a steroid that's similar to prednisone, which is methylprednisolone four days before the transfer. As far as supplements, um, for patients who've had miscarriages, I do recommend taking CoQ10 in the first trimester. And then as far as transferring one or two, it just really depends on your embryo diamonds. What's the implantation rate per embryo that you have? I really like to give patients at least a 50% or higher chance of pregnancy with each transfer. And generally, my goal is to look at the quality and I rank the embryos with the pregnancy rates and then we decide together how many to transfer. Typically it's one embryo at a time for the first two transfers and if we're still not successful we do we transfer two with the third but there are some cases where for whatever reason we actually do consider transferring two the first time but for the most part I'm transferring one at a time for embryos that are high quality and PGT tested so thank you Sarah and I hope everything that you're doing is going to work out for you and I really hope that your PGT report comes back fabulous. This next question is from Tina. Tina says, hi, Dr. Amy. I'm 33 with four euploid embryos in the freezer. That must feel really good. My transfer just got canceled due to my lining not thickening up enough on estrogen 0.1 milligram patches. It only reached six millimeters the day before I was scheduled to start progesterone. And the cutoff at my clinic is seven. The lining was trilaminar and it looked great. Otherwise, I was on aspirin, taking extra vitamin E, doing abdominal massages and light therapy for improving circulation. My saline sonogram was normal. No history of surgeries or pregnancies. What other strategies can help my lining? So I would say maybe estrogen injections. They work really, really great. Maybe do estrogen in a different way. But ask your doctor this question. Doctor, what was my lining when I was doing my IVF cycle? Hmm, if your lining was really great during the IVF cycle, especially at the trigger shot day, aha, you have a strategy. The strategy can be a natural cycle transfer. So sometimes people and their ovaries 
uh, people in their ovaries. <laughs> that sounds like a ding dong thing to say. People in their ovaries. Um, a lot of times women respond really nicely to the estrogen that is secreted from their ovaries. Okay. And just learn a lesson from the stem sheet information that you'll get from your doctor and just look at the lining thickness on the day of the trigger shot. And if that was fabulous, then you know that you can do a natural cycle or even a stimulated or medicated, um, transfer with meds as if you were going to do an egg retrieval, but not necessarily as many, as many meds or as much as you took for your egg retrieval. The next question is, does brand name versus generic matter with estrogen patches? And my experience is no, but also make sure they dose you enough. For me, it's one patch on three days later, patch off two patches on three days later, patch, patch off. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this. Patch, patch, patch on three days later, patch, patch, patch off, patch, 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 on. So I even go up to four patches in patients who have a thinner lining. So I'm not suggesting that they gave up too early, but if you're only at three patches, I would have been like, sweet, your lining is gorgeous. You just need more time. Let's get four patches on, come back in a week and let's see what we have. And I can tell it how your absorption is based on what? Your estrogen level. Okay. So check your estrogen level and see what's going on. But, uh, that's, that's another thing to consider. Um, what is your cutoff thickness for transfers? My cutoff is eight. I like it to be over eight. And there are some patients who have like a gorgeous lining. It's like 7.6. And I'm just like, ah, we're going to go for it. I'm, I'm happy. I'm not going to like wait longer. So next question is what are your thoughts on success with linings being trilaminar, but not super thick? So my thing is being trilaminar is really important. Being super thick is also important. So if I can get both, I'm going to do it. And I'm just going to keep trying until I get both. But if we're at the point I can't get both, if I have more than one embryo, then certainly I'm going to go for it with just a trilaminar texture, even if it's not thick enough. And I've had lots of success with that. This next question is from Hillary. Thank you for answering my questions and all you do. I had my first FET cycle in June with PGT tested normal embryo and it miscarried at five and a half weeks. I'm sorry about that, Hillary. Lining was 9.8 on cycle day 12. I did all the immune tests and the miscarriage protocol. The things they found was my TSH was three and now it's 1.6 on meds. I did a biopsy and it revealed cr uh, mild chronic endometritis and I was treated with flagell doxy for two weeks. I did an SHG in July, which was normal and my hysteroscopy was also normal. <sighs> this is the thing. My second transfer also didn't work. My lining was 7.2, but I was really sick with a cold that turned into chest cold and intestinal symptoms the night of the transfer. Could this be why it didn't implant? It was a 5AA normal embryo. And Hillary, the answer is it could be. I mean, I've had patients get really sick after a transfer and it like devastates me because of course I'm going to hope and pray that whatever they're going through isn't going to affect their implantation rate. But certainly when it doesn't work, I do sometimes think that it had something to do with them being really sick. Next question that Hillary asks, would an ERA be necessary if I have a proven pregnancy miscarriage and I have one child naturally? I have one embryo 5AA left and discouraged because of these excellent tested embryos. They haven't given me a baby. Could the difference be in the lining help? Okay, Hillary, this is what I would do in a case like yours. I would potentially consider doing ERA and receptiva tests as well. You know, do it all. I mean, you might as well run a complete mock cycle, do a biopsy on the day of your line um, of your transfer day, your transfer day in quotes, because obviously it's a mock cycle. Stop meds, period's going to start again, and then transfer after you have all the information. I would do it. You know, I don't want you to look back and wish you had. And I also, you know, feel like it would be nice if you could do another, um, do a transfer and not have to do another egg retrieval. In the past, it looks like your lining was really thick at 9.8. So I would suggest not transferring with a lining of seven if you can help it. So make sure that you advocate for yourself and you tell your doctor, you know what, I just wanna wait until my lining is a little bit thicker. I think that's perfectly fine and hopefully your doctor will agree. Okay, this next question is from Kylie. Kylie asked, what do you think of ovarian rejuvenation using platelet-rich plasma for a 38-year-old with an AMH level of 0.59? I've had two back-to-back -back miscarriages, one with trisomy 13, 
One IVF cycle out of five eggs retrieved, four to blast, one normal. Do you think it helps before an IVF cycle? And I would say, Kylie, I wish that there was something like that that I felt really helped because that would be really cool. I mean, right now we're doing like HGH and lots of supplements. And I wish I could say, oh, you guys, you have to get PRP before your egg retrieval because it's going to help with your egg quality. But I don't know that we've necessarily seen that. I know there's some pretty fantastic doctors out there. They're studying this. They're doing it in their own clinic. And as soon as they tell me, Amy... We got it. We figured it out. We know the dose. We know exactly when to do it. And it totally works. Then I'd be like, guys, I have something to report to you. But until then, I would just say, maybe save your money. And it sounds like you already have one normal embryo. So I would just use the same protocol and hope for the very best. Because I think at 38 years old with an AMH of 0.59, getting one embryo is pretty darn fantastic. I think that's a great, a great set of results there. This next question is from Isabel. Isabel says, Dr. Amy, at what point do you recommend stopping NAD prior to transfer? I'm currently on my first month of depo lupron with a transfer plan for January. I am loving the energy, right? I mean, seriously, right? I'm loving the energy that NAD provides and would like to take it for as long as possible. Thank you. So Isabel, I would stop it at your lining check appointment before your transfer. That's what I would do. That's what, you know, I usually tell my patients, once we have the embryos for the family size that you want, stop the NAD. But some patients, you're right, they like to take it um, after that point and you can stop it at your lining check is what I would tell you if you were my patient. This next question is from Lindsay. Lindsay says, hi, I'm 37 years old with a diagnosis of endometriosis. I have endometriomas on my ovaries, but have not been diagnosed surgically. I've been trying to conceive for two years now, one year on a natural program and now in IVF. I've had three egg retrievals, one canceled cycle because I didn't respond to medications and had only two follicles and they resulted in two PGS euploid embryos total. One day six and one day seven. I'm now preparing for my FET, December 18th, 2020. My protocol includes, here we go, Depo-Lupron for two months and estrogen and progesterone as well as intralipids, low-dose pe aspirin, pepsid, and claritin. Are there any other suggestions you have to increase my chances of success? We want two children and this is our only transfer considering transferring both embryos but haven't decided yet. These embryos are so precious to us since it took us so long to get here. COVID delays and all. And I would really appreciate your second amend. Uh, opinion. Much love, Lindsay XO. Okay, Lindsay, this is the thing. If you really want two kids and you have one day six and one day seven, I would be heartbroken if no one told you that they might not help you reach your goals of two. I know you went through so much already with the depo Lupron, but if you were a patient of mine, I would say, Lindsay, let's really, really reconsider transferring and let's consider doing another IVF cycle first. In addition to that, make sure you've looked at your fallopian tubes. Sometimes endometriosis, not just in the ovaries, can also be in the fallopian tubes. And this fluid in the fallopian tubes can cause lower implantation rates. I've seen it before. And it's heartbreaking when it happens. So I really want you to diagnose it up front. So if you haven't done an HSG in the last year, I highly recommend doing it again. And the other thing to ask your doctor about is whether they think the ERA and receptiva tests could be something for you. So what you do is you take medications as if you're going to transfer, just like you're planning on doing. But on December 18th, you can still use that day to learn more about your body before you actually do the transfer. Do the biopsy, get the report back, and hopefully you'll find out that you were going to do everything right. But if there's one thing you can tweak, you might be like, phew. I'm so glad I did those extra tests, but that's what I would consider doing. Reconsider um, uh, another IVF cycle, do implantation testing before you transfer, and then you can still be taking your CoQ10, all your egg quality supplements right now. Thank you, Lindsay. This next question is from Maggie. Maggie says, hello, Dr. Amy. I am 37 years old. I'm projected to have my first frozen embryo transfer early in December. Due to my history with a miscarriage and two ectopic pregnancies, I'm used to getting lab work done every other day once knowing I'm pregnant. When I inquired my IVF clinic, I was told the first lab work done is done eight days, sorry, actually I misspoke, 10 days after the transfer, then two more times again, every 10 days thereafter. This comes as a shock to me as I expect closer monitoring, not only to rule out an ectopic, but also with other parameters to adjust medications and injections to help foster implantation and maintain pregnancy. What sort of management do you do or recommend after an FET and how often? What specific blood test parameters do you keep track of after FET for your patients? I appreciate your help and thank you in advance. So Maggie, I feel you. I hear you. I would be right there with you. So if a patient of mine had an ectopic, I would say, like, what can I do to prevent that and make sure it happened 0% of the time? So with two, two ectopic pregnancies, I would make sure I've looked at the fallopian tubes. I've looked at them again and then again, 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 again. <laughs> and then said, should this patient have her fallopian tubes removed before I put an embryo in? Because then there's a higher risk of an ectopic. So that's a conversation that we would have in advance. Okay? Okay? You see what I'm saying? And then the other thing that I would have us consider doing 
Um, let me just see here. What was I thinking of? Is eight days post transfer HCG progesterone? I don't check estrogen levels. I have patients that say like, "Aren't you interested in my progesterone?" I'm, estrogen and I'm like no I checked it at your lining check like I don't need to know your estrogen but if my patient wants to know I'm like sure I'll check your estrogen level so 8 10 and if someone has a history of ectopic I'll even go to 12 and then one week later and then as soon as the HCG level hits at least a thousand I'm bringing someone in who has a history of ectopic into my office so I can make sure that pregnancy is right in the uterus and I always tell patients I don't expect to see a heartbeat because when people don't see a heartbeat and you've done an ultrasound they're just like but there's no heartbeat. So I don't expect to see one. So I typically bring patients with a history of ectopic pregnancy in around five to five and a half weeks to make sure that embryo is inside the uterus. So just talk to your doctor about that. Just be like, look, I've had two ectopics. I just don't want to do that again. I know there's an increased risk of ectopic still, even though I've done IVF. So please, can you just help reassure me and see what they say? I imagine your doctor will be like, of course I will help you. You've been through enough. I will help you. So just talk to them like that. Just be like, please. Okay, they should say yes. This question is from Ray. Ray says, my wife had two miscarriages this year, both at around five weeks. First one in May and second one in October. I'm 35 and she's 37. We started trying beginning of this year. We would prefer to conceive naturally and IVF would be our last resort. We will be doing an ultrasound, physical exam, sperm analysis, some hormonal tests and re recurrent pregnancy loss blood test panels. Do you have any advice for us? Okay. Ray, you guys are totally doing the right thing and you're totally on the right track. So basically, you're, you've, you've gone through my angel method by looking at the hormones and the recurrent pregnancy loss blood tests. Just make sure you've done enough genetic screening. So recessive gene screening, karyotype, which would be the chromosome analysis for both of you. And then also look at the anatomy and it looks like you've done that in ultrasound but do look and make sure there's no septum, scar tissue, retained placental tissue from the previous miscarriages. And I feel that at 35, if someone has a really healthy egg count, everything should hopefully work out exactly the way I pray that it will hope it will for you and your lovely way. Okay. Oh, and then take cocoa time. Okay. This question's from Sarah. Sarah says, hello, I'm 38 years young, took some era, had a trigger shout, not shot, shout. I like that. A trigger shout. Um, true story today, I gave someone the trigger shot and she literally thought that I was supposed to be putting it in her ovary. She's like, oh my God, I've been scared this whole time. I thought you were going to inject it into my ovary. And I was like, how is she going to do that? Right? You can imagine how happy she was when I gave her the shot, that little tiny needle in the skin of her tummy. <laughs> she was very relieved. Took the mirror, had trigger shot, now on Cronone. Super excited. I take folic acid, vitamin D, and I'm starting CoQ10, 600 milligrams. Should I be taking ubiquinol instead? If so, how many milligrams a day would I need to give... Uh, would I need given ubiquinol as the active form of CoQ10? Probably around 250 milligrams. You don't need ubiquinol. It all ends up being the same thing. You can take CoQ10 as well. Also, I stopped caffeine and switched to only decaf coffee. Is that okay? Um, it is okay, but you can drink caffeine. Like, I really think you can. I know there are people out there like, no caffeine for you, but I'm like, please, please don't take away my coffee. See, if you told me that I couldn't drink coffee anymore, I would be very miserable. And yes, that is actually black coffee. I drink it all day long so I can be as peppy as I can be all day long. But um, no, I don't recommend doing what I do. Don't do what I do. But I think one to two cups per day is perfectly safe. It doesn't hurt your fertility or pregnancy and it can help with your mood as you're going through all the stuff that's related to IVF, especially the egg retrieval, not just the egg retrieval, but after the egg retrieval and the possible constipation and mood problems and PMS. Like, believe me, you're gonna be really happy that I gave you permission to have your coffee. Also, Sarah says, I drink a small cup of Senna tea every night given that I suffer from major constipation. I heard it's not related to fertility and that will, it will not decrease my chances. Is that true? Sarah, that is true. Senna will not hurt your chances. However, it's going to make you feel so crampy after an egg retrieval. So just watch out. We don't want a poop explosion after your egg retrieval. So be really, really careful about how much Senna you drink after your egg retrieval, especially. <laughs> Didn't think you guys would hear me say poop explosion, but I did. This next question is also from a Sarah, but it's a Sarah with an H. The first Sarah was a Sarah with no H. So Sarah with an H is saying, hello, Dr. Amy. Thank you so much for everything. Oh, you guys, Sarah with an H put two questions in, or I accidentally loaded up the same question twice. So what does that mean? 
I'm done with all your email questions. Yay for me. So what I'm going to do right now is go through all the live chatted questions right now. And here we go. Let's party. So the first question is from who's the lucky person? <laughs> my happy place. I mean, it had to be from my happy place because that's just like an amazing name. Hi, Dr. Amy. If my embryos were PGS tested, how are they graded? With letters or numbers, want to transfer the healthiest embryos. So you have to ask your clinic. Every clinic is different. It's just like every, well, I don't know. Every jewelry, jewelry store is probably going to use the same diamond grading criteria. Most embryology labs use the same Gardner type criteria, but not everybody. So it's number, letter, letter. Number refers to how fast the embryo is growing. Letter refers to the cells that become the embryo. Second letter refers to the cells that become the placenta. Got it? Good. So based on the quality, your doctor will then give you an implantation rate, and then you take the genetic information on top of that, and voila, you rank your embryos, and now you have your fertility roadmap. Next question is from SPF and Sunshine. I'm getting ready to freeze my eggs, but I'm a lifelong vegetarian, and my ferritin level is 10. Is there anything you recommend? Thank you. Um, real quick, lifelong vegetarian, just make sure that you're getting enough plant-based protein. I'm sure you are. So um, what is good plant-based protein? Spinach. Spinach is everything. So I would say talk to a nutritionist. Nina is a fertility coach, nutritionist, and foodfuels.com. See, I can remember these things like that. <laughs> hopefully for a little while longer. Um, but you know, that's a good site to go to if you want to learn more about recipes that can help you. And then I do recommend taking CoQ10 for every young person who's freezing their eggs and for everybody for that matter. And then take CoQ10 until you're done having babies. Allie is asking, is it safe to take CBD while trying to conceive to manage anxiety and poor sleep? It breaks my heart to tell people who have anxiety and insomnia that they can't use their CBD. But the answer is you can't. I really recommend not doing it if you are a patient of mine. So please talk to your doctor about other options. So melatonin, there's a melatonin patch that you can wear. Josephine at Lori, sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching for her meditations. Um, just like figure out what works for you that's not utilizing CBD, whatever you can do. Because I do think that it can affect implantation, the motility of the fallopian tubes, get that? That's like my version of a fallopian tube. Um, it might affect egg quality as well. And same thing for guys and their sperm. No CBD, no THC, please. And I'm sorry, that's so mean. Cause like not sleeping is like, like can make you feel like a crazy person the next day. So I think you really have to balance it. So if you really, really need it, then it's okay. But if you can somehow avoid it, thank you. So this next question is from Jody. Is fresh sperm better for IVF than previously frozen? Does age matter? Jody, great question. If I had a 40-year-old guy right now and he was planning a pregnancy because his wife is freezing her eggs too for whatever reason at 40, I would be like, dude, I want your sperm today. Freeze it. In five years, I'm going to use your 40-year-old sperm, not your 45-year-old sperm. Yes, I do think that sperm age matters. So get that stuff frozen. It's just a cup and a movie or maybe not even a movie. <laughs> It's so easy to freeze sperm, but fresh sperm ultimately is kind of what I recommend for my patients. And we do frozen as backup if there's, you know, just to prevent a sperm emergency or if the sperm counts really low and we're worried there might not be sperm on the day of the egg retrieval. So there are lots of reasons why we freeze sperm, but for the most part, I do like fresh. Jennifer Jackson found out I have blocked tubes and a bulging fibroid. Can't do IUI. Now I have to do IVF. What's better, fresh or frozen? I'm 33. <sighs> okay, Jennifer. Here's the strategy. Step one, embryo creation. Freeze those embryos, okay, before you do surgery. Step two, get the tubes out. If they're blocked and you got a big fibroid, fix that next. You can't go into surgery without having your embryos frozen first. You can. I mean, you can. But when you wake up after surgery, you're going to feel really depressed because you'll be like, I have nothing to look forward to. They took away my tubes and now I don't have embryos and like, all of a sudden, all the ants are going to start crawling in your head, the always negative thoughts that you're never going to get healthy embryos, and what are you going to do then? So I highly recommend IVF first, surgery second, and then transfer. But it seems like the fibroid needs to find a nice home in a cute little jar somewhere, not in your uterus. Next question is from mom to be What to do when there's a medication emergency? I have just eight vials left of my Menopure, day 10 today, but it seems they might ask me to continue. Pharmacy doesn't have Menopure as of today, and I'm getting scared. Mom-to-be, don't worry. Substitute out the Menopure for Gonola for Falastin. Voila. 
75 of Metapure, 75 of FSH, going left for Folliston. I really don't think it's a big deal. I wouldn't sweat it at all. So if you were a patient of mine and you were on 300 of Metapure and 150 of Gonal and you ran out of Metapure for whatever reason, your dog ate it, then I'd be like, well, do you have Gonal at home? Just take 300 of that and make it 450 of Gonal. No big deal, honestly. It's probably not going to make any, it. It's not going to make any difference at all. So I wouldn't sweat it. And your clinic probably has some backup Metapure for you as well. Jody is saying, what's your best chance for a 42-year-old doing IVF? AMH is one, FSH5, estradiol 54, regular periods, and I ovulate regularly. That's fantastic. I think you have a 35% chance of having a successful pregnancy, given the fact that you could potentially get 10 eggs at the age of 42. It's kind of what I'm guessing based on these statistics, assuming you are able to get a genetically normal embryo. So, you know, you get 10 eggs, eight, let's say eight mature, six fertilized, three blasts. Each blast has about a 15 to 18% chance of being genetically normal. So that's where I get those numbers from. Next question. Let's see here. Ren is saying, what's the difference between a day three and a day five transfer? Are there some patients who benefit more from one or the other when you're over 50, 50, 40, <laughs> not 50. Okay. Here's the conversation that I have with patients. Look, is it really important for you to accomplish an embryo transfer? So the thing is, an embryo can look gorgeous on day three, two days later, it can stop growing. And then if you're that patient on day five who really wish that the embryo was put inside her uterus, then do a day three transfer. But if you're someone that's like, I don't want to put myself through a transfer that's not going to work in that horrible two week wait, I'd rather know that I actually have a viable embryo that's growing, I'm going to wait two more days. And then a lot of patients will do genetic testing and freeze their embryos. It's not a perfect test, you guys. It's not. It's like the murkiest crystal ball, and it doesn't take us from a 50% chance of pregnancy to 100%. I really wish that the technology was as good as that and, there were, and that we can know everything about an embryo before we transfer it. No, we really don't. Fallopian Warrior says, does Lupron for an FET cause yeast infections? I've had three all in one month and my transfer is beginning of December. Well, darn it. Well, let's treat it. Okay, boric acid suppositories, Diflucan daily, um, you know, you name it. There's so many different ways of treating uh, yeast infections. So definitely treat it. I would say, yeah, it could be hormonal. Um, yoga is saying, can you take CoQ10 when you're breastfeeding? The answer is yes. It's like having a big spinach salad. Uh, single in sperm. If I'm 32, should I take CoQ10? Yes. Mrs. Carla, any advice before IUI? I'm doing it next month. So before IUI, make sure you've done the tushy check. Tubes, uterus, sperm, hormones, and your genetics. Make sure the sperm is sparkling and you're not wasting your time. Find out your diagnosis and then ask the three questions. What do I want? What is it going to take to get what, get what I want? <laughs> that did not come out right, you guys. And am I willing to do it? And is this IUI? So the question number four for you, is this IUI going to help me? And so if it's like I'm... 38 years old and I want three kids and I'm doing IUI for the first time at 38, I can tell you unless you wanted to adopt baby num or use, a, I shouldn't say adopt because I really want everyone to adopt, who wants to adopt. If it's, I really want to, I'm totally okay with using an egg donor for baby number two or three, then yes, definitely do IUI, but it, but you have to change what you want. I hope that makes sense, you guys. Um, Rose, Rosie is saying, hi, what's the best gonal F IUI protocol daily or every other day injections, how do doctors decide? So the way I decide my IUI protocols is age, diagnosis, and how many eggs I think will give my patient the highest chance of having one baby. I like patients, believe it or not, to ovulate at least four eggs. I just poke myself in the eye. Um, four eggs if they're over the age of 40. And people are like, but I don't want twins. I don't want twins. And I'm like, I want you to have one baby. I want you to have one baby. And I totally get that you're freaking out over having twins. But the reality is at the end of the day, it's all about egg viability. And we know from a really beautiful study that I had Dr. Blake Evans on here describing to us that for women who are over 40, helping them ovulate four eggs in an IUI cycle does not increase their chance of twins. It's only if you get above four that you're giving them a higher chance of twins. Gerilyn says, hi, do uterus polyps impact egg quality doing another egg retrieval? And the answer is no. Polyps are inside the uterus. It's like wearing an earring has nothing to do with your egg quality, right? And an earring has nothing to do with your egg quality. Next question is, can you speak to me about low dose naltrexone dosage and titration and continuation during pregnancy? And the answer is, I can. I don't do it. I don't use it during pregnancy. I can't even think of a reason why anyone would do it during pregnancy. So it's not about titration. It's about stopping it altogether. Ren is saying, do you recommend genetic testing in all patients over 40? I had a consult with two IVF clinics who had differing opinions. And Ren, the answer is, I have an opinion too. My opinion is, it's not right for everybody. And it is something that most patients may benefit from, 
but there's a reason why some clinics may not recommend it, and it could be just in their experience, they haven't found it as helpful for their patients over 40. For me, I have found it to be helpful in my patients over 40. I like to minimize the risk of a miscarriage and increase the chance of a live birth, and a lot of my patients are coming to me wanting more than one baby over the age of 40, so there's this benefit of embryo banking and knowing what you have in, in the bank for the future that genetic testing will give to us. Carrie says, hi, Dr. Amy, thank you for your support. What would you say is the optimal thickness of the uterine lining for transfer? So I like it to be over eight millimeters. That's my personal, my personal preference. Rakshmani is saying, what if your doctor does not use progesterone and oil and he wants to use only vaginal progesterone for the FET? So I would ask them um, why and then see how they're gonna monitor you to know that you are getting enough progesterone and there's certainly ways to do that. So I do have patients who choose vaginal progesterone and I say, you skip one, your efforts are done. And I'm very strict about that. It's like eight, two and eight, don't be late. <laughs> that sounds like it rhymes. I did that on purpose. Hi, Steph. Marianne says, what's the best cycle day to get my sonogram and endometrial biopsy done? Can I do both on the same day? And I'm not sure what you're referring to as far as what you're doing, but for um, implantation testing, for example, I do the saline sono. I do it because I feel very comfortable doing that on the same day as the endometrial biopsy for many patients. Next question is, hi, Dr. Amy. You mentioned you put almost everyone on prednisone four days before the transfer. Do you continue prednisone after the transfer? And the answer is no. And it's how can I get Medrol if my doctor doesn't recommend it? I would say, I don't think you can. Um, next question is, I had two IVF cycles, which were negative. We did ERA and it came that I'm post-receptive and doctor adjusted it to 144 hours. And I did the FET, but it resulted in a negative again. She recommended to repeat the ERA. What do you suggest? So I would recommend making sure you have enough embryos first. If they're not genetic test, genetically tested, focus on that and see if they're normal. Do chromosome analysis if you choose not to do genetic testing on the embryos, just to make sure you're not missing anything. And look at the, the um, possibility of whether you have, for example, silent endometriosis. Look at the cavity really closely and look at all your preconception labs and make sure that you're treating things like a thyroid uh, abnormality, for example. Next question is from Night Nurse. I'm 42 on round three of IVF and finally got one embryo that passed with PGTA testing. How do we optimize our odds for pregnancy? Scheduled for ERA. Talking to the doctor tomorrow about our plan. So see if she'll also do the receptiva test. Uh, maybe consider doing a hysteroscopy or saline sonogram if you haven't had a uh, cavity evaluation. And just like I said earlier, um, do preconception labs like thyroid vitamin D and make sure you're not missing anything like a prolactin abnormality, for example. And just make sure that you are the healthiest version of yourself and you know, practice mindfulness and meditation and talk to a great acupuncturist that will help you. Uh, Marianne's asking, what information does an endometrial biopsy provide? Marianne, go to my website, go to the blog section in the search, put in what is ERA, and you're going to learn a lot about um, what information you can learn. This next question is, what would cause an REI doc to start a patient on 75 versus 150 of menopause, and how many embryos on average can a patient with 16 follicles hope to get? So it just really depends on your age. So let's just say you're 30 years old and you have a follicle count of 60. I would probably get around four um, really high quality, hopefully, um, blastocysts. And, you know, I would say the majority could be genetically normal. So I think that, um, you know, it's the doctor's experience, how many eggs you have, your body size that helps make them um, with their determination uh, of the dose. Next question is from Katya. If planning on doing multiple egg freezing cycles, do you recommend doing back-to-back -back or taking a break? And my answer is it just depends on how many follicles you have. If you're someone with five or less eggs, I'm like, come on back. As soon as your period starts, let's take a look. If the egg count is still really good and your ovaries aren't swollen, we go right back into it. But for patients who have over five eggs, sometimes the ovaries just need a break. They're just a little too swollen and they just need an extra month to rest. Next question is... Let's see here. Um, I take NAC, NAD, CoQ10, prenatal vitamin D, B12, omega-3, zinc. What else can I take to help implantation? And I think you're on everything. I don't think you need the NAD, honestly. Um, I think you got it all. Next question is, do intralipids work? And I would say, I think they kind of help heal our brains because I think when you, when you are told that you have something called a natural killer cell elevation, you just imagine these cells that are like eating your embryo. And it's like the worst thing in the world. And I wish that it wasn't called natural killer cells. They should be called like human protection cells because like natural killer just sounds evil. And if, if I check natural killer cells on people, almost always, I just, thank God it wasn't my coffee this time. I almost always find an abnormality and the treatment is actually really easy. It's called intralipid infusions. And um, I don't know if they really work and they actually probably don't. And I tell my patients that but it feels good to be doing something that could potentially help. 
Chrissy is asking, does HGH improve egg quality? And I say yes. Kate by the Bay says, my best friend just had her second miscarriage. What do you tell couples for whom fertility treatment will be hard? So Kate by the Bay, I would say go have your friend, oh, hard financially. So I would say, um, you know, maybe consider working with folks like uh, futurefamily.com so they finance fertility treatment. I would also suggest that they narrow down the diagnosis as soon as possible so they have the highest chance of success with whatever treatment they do because obviously that would be very cost effective. So angelmethod.com and then they can also take my class, the IVF class through eggwhisper.schools, eggwhisperschool.com. Vienna asked, Dr. Amy, how can I avoid PGS abnormal embryos? I had a failed IVF cycle due to abnormal PGS embryos. What can I do to have healthy ones? Vienna, oh my goodness, like I wish I had like a solution. But the best thing I can do are supplements, healthy lifestyle, and joy. I'm trying to bring the joy back. <laughs> and the reason is like I had, I've had like some really, really tough cases. And I felt recently like the difference between one cycle versus the next in a patient was like true joy. So it's not just joy, like being happy. It's joy through connections with other people and feeling like you're connected to other humans. And I think we're missing so much of that. And so I feel like I'm going to discover that there's some connection, some gene. <laughs> there's some like brain thing that happens when you're connected to other people and feel well supported and loved that your eggs are just like, I feel loved and I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do and help you have a normal blastocyst. I'm totally joking. That is really not a thing, but I know life is so hard and being a fertility patient is so hard. So, I mean, that's the best thing that I can offer you. I know it's not the best. Sammy says, hi, Dr. Amy. I was advised to use a sperm donor. Advised, because my husband doesn't have any. His FSH is high, prolactin is also high. How do I choose a good sperm donor? And what questions do I ask about sperm? So what I would do is ask your clinic if they help with photo matching. And if not, no big deal. Um, there are different uh, sperm banks, which are fabulous. Seattle Sperm Bank is one of my faves, as well as Fairfax. And then there's California Cryobank, the Sperm Bank of California in Berkeley. And um, there's one more, North west sperm bank so all of these sperm banks you can reach out to them talk to their uh, sperm bank directors send them a picture of your husband and see how they can help you find um, a sperm donor that's going to resemble him as much as possible and then make sure that you've done a carrier screen to ensure that your genes and the sperm donor's genes are genetically compatible so when you move forward there are no surprises just really great good surprises that everything is awesome um, next question is, would fluid in the uterus resemble Asherman's syndrome on ultrasound? And the answer is, it could. You can see a pocket of fluid in Asherman's and um, with a hydrocell ping, but yes. Uh, next question is, 39 years old, stimming in my sixth cycle. I have two day threes on ice. I typically only get one to two embryos. You suggest freezing at day three or pushing to day five. I've done one fresh day three transfer, which failed. You know, it's so hard. I mean, I like to have as much information as possible for my patients before I freeze the embryos. And it's, and I get it, like, I know some centers freeze as day three, and I totally respect that. And I think that um, what happens is if you freeze on day three, you're just always wondering, like, what's the potential of what you have? And do you really have viable enough embryos? So letting them culture for, you know, culturing them for two more days could give you the answer that you might need. So maybe this next cycle will be culture for two days, and that might give you a good idea as to what the potential viability is of the day three embryos that you have. That's just a thought. Um, let's see here. Uh, night nurse says, I think I am going the wrong direction. Um, let's see here. What is a normal antral follicle count for women under the age of 35? So I would say it's usually around eight to 10. And then if you're under the age of 30, it's usually around, let's say, you know, 10 to 15. Is that number a factor in deciding IVF med protocol? And the answer is absolutely. Um, next question, <laughs> um, is, uh, what is NAD good for? And it's good for egg quality. Next question is, what is the daily dose of CoQ10 that you recommend? And I recommend around 300 to 600. You guys, I'm almost done with every single chatted question. Oh my God. Yay me. Um, Mal has asked, what do you recommend for FET prep for someone with endometriosis and endomyosis? I'm afraid of Lupron side effects. That's okay. You don't have to do a uh, Lupron. You can take Erlissa. It's just a pill very similar to Lupron. You can stop it right away if you hate it. You can also do a course of Femera only with Agestin for one to two months, depending on how bad your endometriosis and adenomyosis is. You can also consider a laparoscopy. Obviously, surgery also has side effects, so I don't take those side effects lightly, but talk to your doctor about all the different ways that you can manage endometriosis before your next transfer. Last question is, if I had my tubes removed, where could fluid in my uterus be coming from? And the answer is, it could be cervical mucus. It'd be coming from below. So people respond that way to 
estrogen. So you might want to consider a natural cycle transfer and no estrogen. Some people are super sensitive to it. Um, the other possibility is there could be some scar tissue inside the uterus. So you might want to consider looking and doing a hysteroscopy. And you might be a good candidate for taking Claritin Mucinex, for example, during your frozen embryo transfer cycle. And sometimes you can see a little bit of mucus or fluid in the cavity. Then you start progesterone and then I bring patients in the day before the transfer and it disappears. And you're like, voila mucus is gone. Okay, you guys, love you all. I'm done with all your questions, and I hope you guys have a great Thanksgiving week. And you know I'll be here again very, very soon. So don't miss me. Go to asktheegwhisperer.com to ask your questions. Um, sign up for my next class through eggwhispererschool.com, and I can't wait to see you guys in class. Have a great night, and have a great rest of your week. Good night.